Do, 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 do. There we are. Hi. Hi. How Hi, are you? Buddy. Welcome happy, to Wine for Bet Street. Yes, happy Wine for Bet Street. <laughs> Elmo is very happy today. And we found out just he talks. He talks. Elmo is one ticklish monster. <laughs> The things you learn a year later. <laughs> I know. I know. And actually, I think today is our 12th episode. Yes, it is. So happy, happy anniversary. anniversary. <laughs> Woo. Who wow. would have thunk it? Oh, yeah. Who would have thunk it? I know. So, yes. So today we are on the letter L. Lambrusco. Lambrusco. And I have to say, this is kind of an exciting one for me biologically, because this grape, which we will talk about later, is very different than all of the other grape varieties that we're used to. You know, the, yeah. the Vetus vinifera that we are used to, Lambrusco throws that out the window. So um, I will talk about that in a little bit. But are we ready for our we are our, our uh, little mascot? Sure. All Go right. So the letter of the day is L, and it is for Lambrusco. Now, I don't know, Debbie, This I have never had a Lambrusco before. I have. You have? I okay. have. And I sent my husband in to buy one bottle of Lambrusco. I said just under $20, and he came home with four bottles. I'm like, What's a Lambrusco party? I'm like, what were you thinking? <laughs> You know, he's like, oh, I, I couldn't decide. It's like, all right. Okay. I don't know, because I kind of, my thought process of Lambrusco is my grandparents sitting around the table during the summer in West Milford, New Jersey, with that bottle this big of Lambrusco. And them just drinking it all night and me like, oh, can I have a sip? Can I have a sip? And so sweet and so like, ah, ah, whatever. Yeah, um, I don't have any memory, memories like no. that. But. but so I, you know, during the research, I was like, I was pretty excited because they're talking about how they've reinvented basically yes. reinvented Lambrusco and it is no longer, they actually talked about the grandparents and, you know, the, the old Italian immigrants drinking it and how it's no longer really that, how they've increased the quality. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to. What I, what I thought was interesting was the different Lambrusco varieties. It's not just one grape. Yes. That's yeah. what I, you know, like you say Chardonnay and Chardonnay is Chardonnay. You're going to get, you know, right. depending on the region where it's grown, it might taste different if it's oaked or unoaked, but it's Chardonnay. Right. And right. Lambrusco is a little bit different. Yes, which we will get into in a little bit. So um, we do general, I forgot my little outline. We introduce ourselves first. Yes, I always forget that. Go ahead. You go first. Okay. I'm Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a certified uh, specialist of wine and a wine location specialist in port and champagne. Um, I'm the author of Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries, Visiting the Hudson Valley and all the craft beverage producers and farmers markets and sites along the way. Um, I'm co-owner now of a restaurant that's been, or I'm partner 
in uh, operation since March 30th in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, called Kitchen 330. I'm partner in Happy Bitch Wines. And if anybody ever comes to me with another project, I've got to say no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, well, Elmo thinks it's funny, too. <laughs> it's funny too. <laughs> well, I'm Lori of Dracina Wines. My husband, Michael, and I are the co-owners of the award-winning Cabernet Franc producers in Paso Robles, California. We also produce a rosé of Syrah, and we've just started our wine club, which is taking off, and I'm so excited that you know people are, and, and honored that people are signing up for our wine club. Um, the Chalk Club, which is kind of in a roundabout way, named after our other Weimar honor, Vegas. Um, of course, betting chalk is betting all the winners, and you know our Weimar honor is now Vegas, named after Las Vegas. Um, but so basically, Cabernet Franc, founders of Cab Franc Day, Rosé of Syrah. I don't know, maybe something coming up in the near last future. Night. I had your rosé last night. It was really good. What? Your rosé. I had your rosé last night. It was really good. I haven't posted pictures yet, but it was you really did. Good. Yeah. I, see, I didn't even know that. I yeah. didn't even know that. Um, I was beyond yeah. thrilled. I actually went to bed last night and um, I woke up uh, to my phone buzzing uh, at like 1130 last night. And I just happened to roll over and look at it. And somebody had posted a picture of our rosé. Um, if you are in the wine club, part uh when we send you your shipment we send you a recipe recommendation and uh richard burrito um actually did that actual recipe which was salmon on uh planks nice and, uh so he posted a picture of it and said we nailed the pairing perfectly and uh I, I was like so so thrilled, especially considering I meet salmon. So I was, you know, I was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, this will go, this will go. Kind of with pulled pork with uh, South Carolina type of pulled pork, which is uh -huh. on the vinegary side, and it worked well. Oh, oh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Oh, never, you know what? It's like, I mean, I don't have children, but I, I kind of think that it's kind of like. You know, somebody giving your child a compliment. This is, you know, these wines are our babies. And when people post that they enjoyed our wines or they put their pairings or whatever, it, it, it never gets old hearing that people enjoy our wines. So yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put Elmo away because I apparently keep hitting Elmo. Um, so let's get into Lambrusco. Lambrusco. So uh, you are up first with general characteristics. Or, general. Or do we want to taste this? I'm kind of a little nervous. Okay. okay. So we can taste first if you want. I haven't poured mine yet. So it's we're a so bit. dark. Oh, mine isn't. Yours. Oh, my God. Look at the difference in color. But wait till you see my characteristics. You'll see why. Okay. But, yeah. Usually the Lambruscos, I have to figure out the lighting in my room here, my office. So I have a lantern here. So <laughs> You're going camping. Yes. I have to figure out how to get more light in here. If anybody listening has any suggestions, I'm open to them because it's in a little alcove. I said you didn't, didn't for a surprise. <laughs> People on the podcast cannot cannot see my face right now hmm. um well that's different yes um, mine is a little different it's different i've, I've had the one that paul, <coughs> that paul brought right. was dark like that one of the ones was dark that we drank <coughs> very effervescent this one um this is this when i popped it it had a lot of effervescence like the cork and i had it in the refrigerator since yesterday so okay. it was cold because 
you know, when you pop a cork, it, it needs to be cold if you don't want it to go flying 50 feet into the air. Um, so it definitely was cold enough, um, but there was a lot of pressure underneath it. So I was expecting quite a bit of effervescence, but I mean, this is a horrible glass. I probably should have poured it into a. Yeah, but you know what? It, it, even my in my glass, you can see the bubbles a little bit. Yeah, yeah, not. But I'm not. It's not. It's not, it's not like champagne. No, know? no, it's not. Um, Although I mean, you know, this is a um, a grape fruit roll up. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mine's not as sweet though. This is actually not bad. I mean, I'm not. It's not. Honest. No, it's not. It's I'm not, not a big so fan. But hey, Michael. What is the typical alcohol percent? Um, that's a good question. What is my alcohol percentage? Um, I ripped the living daylights out of my label. Um, oh, wait. I have it in my notes for the... Um, oh, so do I. I'm so stupid. I'm looking at the, bo at the bottle, but I think I have it in my notes. Um, this is only 9% alcohol, Michael. Um, Damn, I can like have this whole bottle, but I don't. Boy, I don't have the alcohol content. Yeah, mine is only nine percent. Um, I do believe Lambruscos are on the lower, on the lower side. I, 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 I think if you have a. Oh, uh, well, this is this is an eleven and a half percent. I was going to say nine to twelve. I, I was going to say higher than twelve would be rare. Um. So, yeah, mine is nine. That's not even alcohol to my liver. And mine's eleven and a half percent. So nine to eleven percent. It's just yeah, yeah. So all right. So Debbie, what what's our general characteristics? Let's start with the general characteristics. Oh, keto. Let's go into uh, slide presentations, and we will start. Okay. Oops. Oops, we don't want to go too fast. We don't want to go too fast. So Lambrusco is a family of grapes, and each of them, each individual grape has um, typical characteristics, and as do their respective resulting wines. Lambrusco is a red sparkling wine, and it's typically fruity with good acidity, sometimes savory and tannic, but generally relatively dry. So I guess that's where the fruity comes in. Mm -hmm. um, Lambrusco is made using the same, using the traditional method um, as champagne is, where fermentation happens in the bottle. And um, I actually, well, when we get to my wine, I have a riddling. I show them riddling. Ooh. So, yeah. So. Um, so they do it in, they do it in, in, uh like you said, champagne, they do it in, in bottle. Cause right. my impression was that most Lambruscos were done like Prosecco. Oh, tank, tank method. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you have a special one there. I guess I'm special today. Yeah. I've had a lousy day, so yeah. I am special. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so these are the different, um, the happy families of grapes. So Lambrusco di Sobera, Lambrusco Mistri, Lambrusco Grasparoa, Lambru which is also, and I can't pronounce these things, Lambrusco di Castelvitro, there's Lambrusco Salamino, and I can't read what, you're in my way, Lori, you got a duck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the little square thing is there. Um, Lambrusco Marnie. So for the next slide, if I can get to it, is aromas and flavors. Let me just go. Did I not? Um, all right. So these are the aroma and flavors of Lambrusco Sobara. And actually, that's what my Lambrusco happens to be. Okay. Um, 
Mine is the Castle of Vetero. Okay, cool. So Lambrusco di Sorbara, it grows in sparse conical clusters bearing uh, fruit, um, an abundance of which varies year to year due to flowering abnormalities, which can give rise to considerable loss of fruit. So it's, um, they don't know what causes the issue. Um, and they think it's uh, the sterility of the pollen. Mm -hmm. The traditional area of cultivation lies between Sechia and Panero uh, rivers formed in conjunction floodplains of the two rivers where the soils are sandy and loose and rich potassium. When the vines grown on soils with higher clay content, the wine takes on a deeper color than usual and loses much of its scent. That's interesting. Um, so the color is the lightest of the Lambrusco grapes. It may look like a rosé, but it's indeed a red wine, kind of like mine. The grape has skins with a little pigment the wines made with the scrape tend to be fragrant, floral, fresh and fruity, bright acidity and dry. Strawberry, raspberry aromas, hints of violet, red berry. Um, so those are the aromas and flavors of that particular one. Then we get on to Lambrusco Grasparosa and Lambrusco di Castelvetro. Is this the one that you have? Yeah, that's what I have. I have Lambrusco di Castellavitero. Okay, so the vines um, are distinguished by a special characteristic. In the fall, the leaves turn, not just the leaves turn red, but the stalks and the um, pedicels turn red. The grapes, they range from plummy dark blue to blackish. They have a thick skin, contain uh, medium juice, Swedish, um, uh, uh, Swedish. Uh, due to its lack of vigor, the Lambrusco grasparosa vine is best cultivated in smaller vineyards. Um, it's a dark wine, deep ruby in color, red and black fruit, tannins. It can be dry, uh, savory, bright acidity. Fuller body wine due to the clay soil, and it can leave a bitter taste in your mouth and a uh, scent of peach and almonds. Do you get any of that in yours? Uh, I am uh, I am cherry and almond. You're cherry and almond? Cherry and almond, and I, I kind of, you know what, I wouldn't have said violet, except I saw violet, so you know how that puts it in your brain. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is like opening a bag of almonds. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There's, there's cherry, there's, there's cherry, but the flavor is, is grape fruit roll. <laughs> <laughs> so Lambrusco Salamino. Yep. That one's up next. Um, here the soils are accumulations of sediment left behind by the flooding of various rivers and streams that cross the Modenese Plains from south to north. Silt, sand, and clays are present throughout the area. So that's what influences um, the grape. The wines here tend to be ruby colored, purple edge, purple hue, uh, fruity and grapey, bright acidity, and it has a dry fin finish. And it's grown around Modena and Reggi Amelia. Lambrusco Mastery. Ooh, double bubble, my favorite gum <laughs> on the face of the earth. <laughs> yes, this, uh, this actually uh, was found to be the parent, have a parent offspring relationship with Fortana. That's another grape I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, maybe we'll try that for F. Um, it's hardier. Um, its wine is dark, dark wine with intense purple hues, um, uh, purple tones with a deep ruby hue, 
fruity flesh, bubblegum characteristics on the aroma, complex flavors of dark plums, ripe blackberry, milk chocolate, and violet. It's soft and creamy with a fresh grapiness quality. So I don't know. I don't know. That kind of sounds interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I mean, I seriously love like double bubble. Like seriously, my you want to be my friend? Bring me double bubble. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if I want that in a wine. But yeah. The, the maybe the, chocolate covered cherries with the mixture of the oh, two. yeah. Would but a violet be? seems to be the main. You know, yeah. throughout the whole. Throughout all of them, violet yeah. is yeah is there. There it is again. <laughs> and an iris. Yeah, violet gets around. So Lambrusco, uh, we're on Lambrusco Marani, right? Yeah, Lambrusco Mar Marani. I need a pronunciation class. <laughs> um, these wines um, are not as fruity, but tannic and acidic. Floral, you'll get violets, iris, peonies, black currant, and red cherry. When it's well made, it's not too tannic and it's bright with a juicy personality. So that sounds it. more like something I could deal with. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's interesting. You know, we should have, it would have been interesting to try all these different grapes side by side you mean if we researched prior to buying the bottle <laughs> yeah and we and we were together for a tasting and tasted yeah all, all of the different uh varietals i mean right the main thing that they have is that they are all have violets and yes. they're all red and black fruit yeah they all they all are either red cherry or black currant or both yeah. kind of yeah yeah, red cherry. This one's got plum. I don't know about the bubblegum thing. You know, here's, you know, red and black fruit. Red See, and they black. all have the black currant and the red cherries, too. The yeah. Bing, they look like Bing cherries. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So, it is my turn for history. And, um, you know, as as I said at the beginning... Um, you know, what comes to mind when you think of Lambrusco, you know, my, on my mom's side anyway, because, you know, dad is Irish, Scottish, German, you know, beer, um, you know, we, uh, but on my mom's side is Italian. So there was Lambrusco on the table and, uh, even dad liked Lambrusco, um, but, uh. You know, I was a little kid just taking a sip there. Um, but the first thing that entered my thoughts was sitting around my table during the summer with my great grandmother and grandparents drinking out of this massive jug, you know. Um, and it was a sparkling wine, but it was bad. And um, I think the biggest thing that I remember is Ria Needy on Ice. Isn't it nice? Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. I think that was the downfall of Lambrusco right there. Um, but, you know, if that's what their marketing scheme was, it kind of tells you what the quality of the wine was back then. Right? You know, we're doubt, you know, throw the ice on, throw the ice on. Um, but what's kind of cool and, you know, biologically, Lambrusco is amazing. Um, so it's actually one of the oldest wines and has a genealogical heritage of wild vines. So it is the wild one of grape varieties. Uh, the ancient Romans used to call it Labrusca from the Latin Labron, which actually means edge or border. And it's that's a perfect name for it because it used to grow or it still actually grows uh, wildly along the edge of vines. Uh, I'm sorry, the edges of fields. So these are actually the non-domesticated grapevines. So our Chardonnays, our Merlots, our Cap Francs, they're all, they've all been domesticated. 
So these are, you know, the wild ones out there. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, we have the domesticated uh, dogs, you, you know, they live in our houses, they're tame. And then you've got, um, uh, oh, just went out of my head. What's they're called in Australia? The uh, Outback? No, the, the dogs. Um, there's dogs out running wild in Australia, um, you know. I'm going to say the wrong word and it's probably going to mean something else. So I don't want to say it. Um, but you know, there's, there's wild dogs, there's wild cats versus domesticated cats. Uh, Lambrusco is the, the non domesticated, the wild grapes. Um, Lambrusco is different than any other of the grape vines we're familiar with because it is a wild vine. It actually can pollinate with like anything that's out there. So, <clears throat> Our grapes that we're used to, the Chardonnays and all of those, you know, they're they're self-pollinating and they kind of stay within, you know, their own species. And we have our clones where Lambrusco is like, I'm going to send my pollen out there. My stigma is going to be ready to accept any pollen. So they actually can pollinate um, with other grape varieties dandelions, wildflowers, like they'll pollinate with anything. So we get a lot of different Lambrusco varieties. So um, so you were talking about some of, some of the different varieties, and that's all because they've pollinated with something other than their own grape uh, clusters. Um, so next up is... Uh, Back in the time, the Romans actually fermented the Lambrusco in an amphora. And this is a pretty decorated amphora that's found in the National Museum of Scotland. And what they did was they would fill this with the wine and they closed it and placed the amphora underground to keep it well chilled. But if they wanted it to be sparkling, they actually would put it in a little warmer place and that would allow for the, uh, the fizziness. Okay, so Modena, Parma, and Reggio Emilia are the best known regions for Lambrusco. Uh, archaeologists have found seeds that offer proof that the Lambrusco grapevine thrived in the Modena and that the people who lived there paid a great deal of attention to it. They really loved this vine. They, you know, it wasn't, even though it was wild, they they kind of tended to it. They paid attention to it. They picked it. They watched what was going on. Um, there are, as you said, there are several types of Lambrusco, De Modena, depending on the type of grape and the region where it is grown. It is most li widely produced in the hills surrounding Modena, but also grows in nearby Reggio Emilia and even in Parma and Lombardy. Now, the downfall of Lambrusco was by far the 1970s, where although they there were dry versions of Lambrusco, it is typically a dry wine. During the 1970s, the Americans were drinking the cheap sweet wines. And what happened was the Italians were like, yeah, these people in the 70s, man, they're going to drink all this sweet stuff. Yeah, we're going to pump them with all this basic garbage and they're going to soak it up. And that's exactly what happened. So the Italians flooded the market with the sweet stuff because the people were pretty much, I'm going to go. I'm stuck. Not that this was historically found in any documentation, but it was the 70s, you know. Uh, they didn't know what they were drinking. So anything sweet, you know, while they were at, uh, all I keep thinking is Goldfinger um, from uh, Austin Powers and uh, Studio 54. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, so the Italians uh, flooded the market with the sweet stuff. And as the decade came to a close, people started to go, their palates started to change and they started to realize there were differences in wine. And unfortunately for Lambrusco, it got caught up in the past. So people saw Lambrusco as fruity and sweet and they began to turn their noses up to it. 
So this is a little similar to some of the slides that you uh, presented. Um, Lambrusco is actually the name of the grape and it is the name of the region in which it is grown. With all the different types of Lambrusco, we have Grasparosa, Salamino, and Sorbara, those being the most common ones. Lambrusco Grasparosa uh, de Castellavetro, which is what I have, uh, tend to be the most tannic and full-bodied, while Lambrusco de Sorbara will be the most fragrant. Now, where do you know which region you're at? Are you Sabora? I have violets. I get actually a little almond on it too. Yeah. I don't so know there are actually have been identified over 60 varieties of Lambrusco throughout Italy. That's a lot of that's a lot of varieties. That's a lot of that's a lot of Lambrusco. Um and as uh, I had said earlier, um, I don't know if we were on air or off air at that point, um, but most Lambrusco is actually made in steel tanks, but there are a few that are still made in the traditional champagne mm -hmm. method, which yeah. is what you have, mm -hmm. with a second fermentation in bottle. So Italians are now fighting hard to show that they are more than just the cheap, sweet red wine of the 70s. They are lobbying to have Lambrusco um, only on wine labels, Italian wine labels, kind of similar to how champagne has to be produced in champagne. So they're trying to get it to be very regimented uh, so you know what you're getting. Uh, depending on where you look, there is a mention of anywhere between 4 and 12 Lambrusco uh, denominations, de originel, uh, so DOCs. Uh, and that, I think, is their first thing they have to do. So depending on where you are looking, some some resources say there are only four DOCs that are true Lambrusco, and others say there are anywhere up to 12. So I've seen four, eight, and 12. Those are the main numbers. So I, right off the bat, that's that's a marketing issue right there. If they're going to try to promote Lambrusco and to have it as, you know, like a champagne concept, mm -hmm. they need to say, no, these are the DOCs, this is it. And it, no matter where you look, it needs to be the same thing. So yeah. it was, it was very difficult to understand what was a Lambrusco DOC, what wasn't. Uh, all right. So this is a uh, Lambrusco Grasparosa de Castellavino, um, Castavero, the smallest wine producing region located south of the town of Modena. The region is home to Grasparosa, of which the DOC requires 85% of the wine to be composed of the actual Lambrusco. The wine of this region is typically dry and full bodied with a deep purplish red color. Well, I sure as heck will say this is a deep purple <laughs> red coloring, and it is definitely a full-bodied wine. Um, Grasparosa produces the most tannic Lambrusco. Uh, Mantovano is the only Lambrusco region outside of Emilia-Romagna in the Lombardy region. So this style is typically dry, but there are some semi-dry styles available from this region. Next up is the Reggiano. This is the largest producing region of Lambrusco and the source of the most of the exported DOC designated wines. The four Lambrusco grapes that can be used are Maestri, Marane, Monterico, and Salamino and up to 15% of added Ancelotta grapes are permitted into this DOC. I, don't, I didn't look up what Ancelotta is, but there, there's another A for us if we can there get there. There you go, yeah. We can get there, um, for season two. The sweet versions of the wine are typically in the light-bodied frizzante style, while the drier wines are more full-bodied and significantly darker in color. Next, the Salamino de Santa Croce. 
which is actually located seven miles west of the village of Serbana. The wines of this region must be composed of at least 90% of local Salamino Lambrusco. So the wines are typically light in color and body with a fazante style, being both made in the semi-sweet and dry styles. The variety gets its name from the resemblance of the grape clusters, which look like sausage or salami. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have uh, where you, where yours is from, yeah. De Sabara. Okay. Lambrusco de Sabara is located north of Modena, near the village of Sabara. Sabara is generally regarded as the highest quality variety producing the most fragrant, fragrant wines. It has some similarities to Lambrusco Salamino, but produces a darker and more full-bodied wines. The color can range from a deep ruby to a purplish hue, which I'm going to say you're more along the ruby side. Yeah. Right? Um, in this wine region, only Sabora or Salamino are permitted uh, to be in the bottle if it is DOC designated, and at least 60% need to be Sabara. The Salamino and Sabara varieties tend to produce the most acidic wines. So that's got my, you know, I'm such the acid head. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why Sabara tends to produce the highest quality Lambrusco is the tendency of the vine to drop its flowers, which reduces the fruit yields and thereby concentrates the flavors. So there is my history. Interesting. Yeah, there's the wild, there's a the wild child. In Lambrusco. The wild child. The wild child. I was like trying to find a video of um, uh, the wild thing from oh, um, yeah. uh, the baseball, uh, whatever that baseball movie is, Charlie Sheen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. All right. So. Can we talk about our wines. We shall talk about our wines. Um, well, although I kind of already have, but <laughs> what you got? Mine is 70. I have a Pira uh, Peltranier. Peltranieri. Peltranieri yeah. is the wine uh, winery. Oh, Pira an is interesting the label. Yeah. There's got to be something significant about the label. I couldn't find my answer, though, and yeah. it was a little late in the day for me to email them. But this is 70% um, Lambrusco Sobara and 30% Lambrusco Sal Salamino. Sal Sal right. Because as we just learned, it has to only contain those two. Yep. And, it, and mine actually does. Yeah. Um, so um, it is dry, I will say. Um, and it, the winery itself is in its fourth generation. Oh. And I'm going to read to you if I can find it. Um, so right now it's under the fourth generation, Alberto Paltrinieri. And I'm going to just read a little clip and then I, I've got a little video to show. So he okay. says, when he finished his studies, my father asked me what I wanted to do in life. My answer was that I wanted to keep alive the tradition of work that grandfather Achilles had begun in 1926 and that he and my mother had been running for 40 years. In 1998, with my wife, Barbara, I started directing the winery, gambling on the production of the first mono varietal Sorbara. Since then, I have managed and produced 17 hectare acres of vineyards in the historic area of the Cristo di Sorbara, the thinnest extension of land between Sechia and Panaro, the two rivers that embrace the province of Modena. Huh? So I lost you there. <laughs> I gotta find, <laughs> gotta find the right tab. So instead of just reading, um, you know, stuff, they have a really nice three minute video that explains Three generations of wine growers, a life 
dedicated to the pursuit of excellence in winemaking. Alberto Paltrinieri from Sobara. My family has lived and worked here for three generations, turning the grapes from our vineyards into wine, showing respect and giving value to that which is given to us every year is an endeavor that we renew with each season. This is how Alberto Paltrinieri talks about his involvement in the world of wine. An involvement that has grown simultaneously to the popularity of Lambrusco in the world. Today, Alberto and his wife Barbara, with the precious help of viticulturist Stefano Dini and enologists Attilio Pagli and Leonardo Conti, take care of a 15 hectare vineyard situated near the town of Sobara in an area known as Il Cristo. This area consists of a thin strip of land extending between the rivers Secchia and Panaro, which embrace the province of Modena. Video. There you go. There we go. Oh, so I was you go? Proud, it was really it was a really informative um, video on okay. the vineyard and and the winery and stuff. So if you wanna learn more, go go to the uh, video there on YouTube. So my guy here is Donnelly, and okay. it is setting up a storm. Um, and I destroyed the label. Uh, so it is Donnelly, and as I said, it is from um, Grasparosa de Castelvetro, and it is based in the northern Italian region of Emilia Romagna. Donnelly has been producing wine since actually 1915. So uh, in 1915, when Adolfo Donnelly transitioned from bottling wine in his home cellar to launching the full-scale winery, from the start, Donnelly dedicated himself to the production of Lambrusco. I guess if you're going to live there, that's what you're going to make. I mean, yeah. you know. Um, the Giacobazzi family took control of the winery in the mid-90s and has been carrying on the respected traditions of the Donnellis. Antonio Giacobazzi is now president of Donnelli and has joined the businesses with three of his children, Alberto, Giovanni, and Angela. Their vineyards span 110 acres, which is quite a bit. Uh, and Donnelli's estate-owned vineyards are planted in various strains of the native Labrusco varietal, as well as other indigenous grapes. So what what I'm kind of getting is a lot of red berries. I get that almond, big time almond. I get the almond in mine too. Yeah, they the aroma. they say they're spicy notes. I am not getting any spice, but that's what they're saying. Um, it, it's, even though the region is known to be highly tannic, uh, this is not a very tannic wine. Um, not, I wouldn't say it's tannic. Mm. But it does have quite, it does have a decent amount of acidity. Uh, the grapes for this wine were grown on a calcareous and clay soil. And they were hand harvested and then vinified in stainless steel tanks with maceration at a controlled temperature. Um, the wine, fine, producing using the Charmant or the tank method for the second fermentation. 90% Lambrusco Grasparosa, 10% Malbo Gentile. Wow. Wow. Um, and that is all from the city of Modena. Those are from the city of Modena. And the average grape, uh, I'm sorry, the average vine age is 
uh, 20 years. As I said earlier, it's 9% uh, alcohol. It's got 7.5% acid or 7.5 grams per liter of acidity and 35 grams per liter of residual. So, yeah, wow. Um, it doesn't really taste that sweet at all. I mean, I wouldn't. Probably the acidity ba acid balance. Yeah. Acidity. Yeah. It's just not my cup of tea, you know. It's not my um, cup of tea. It does retail for, um, you know, everything is always on sale right by the wine. So it's typically uh, $12, but I got it for $9.99. Um, yeah, mine was ten dollars. Right, right. Yeah. So, all right, we are going to go to food pairings. All right. So here we go. The food pairings. Since Lambrusco hails from the Amelia Romagna region of Italy, you know you got to go like with like. So you're going to be looking at a lot of Italian type foods. First up is pork. So smoked pork shank with Lambrusco sauce and roast uh, bologna uh, potatoes. And the recipe is down there that is being blocked by you. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd eat the potatoes. So there we go. But roast pork shank. I would eat pork. Oh, what did I just do? I think I hit. Okay. Um, next is a charcuterie. Uh, I mean, seriously, any wine can go with that, you know. Um, but they recommend uh, the whole muscle meats. So, you know, those with that nice little blah in there. Um, so prosciutto, dry cured, um, aged pig's leg, uh, brasola, which is beef prosciutto, capicola, which is dry cured single muscle from the top of the shoulder, and smoked ham, which is serrano ham. Um, so... I don't consider it a charcuterie unless there's cheese, and there's no cheese. I, there, I, I guess, yeah, is that cheese there? Blue cheese, it's blue cheese. No, oh, okay, well, yeah. I don't, I don't do blue, so there we go. All right, next is uh, porchetta, which okay. is rolled pork with herbs. Um, so Mike makes this. Um, do you eat it? Um, no. <laughs> Um, Mike makes it uh, when my parents are around because they like it. Um, they like it a lot, so I guess it's good. I don't know, but no, I do not. I pizza. pizza baby. That's mine, by the way. Um, that is my pizza. Uh, so if you can see that that way down there, recipe found on wine pairing with dressinawines.wordpress.com. Um. That is Mike's favorite dough recipe right there. It's a little it deep dish. Good stuff. All right, next up is barbecued, barbecued chicken. chicken. Yep. And there's my jam. Uh, Parmigiano Reggiano uh, and Grana Padano. Uh, those, well, Grana Padano is... I love that cheese. That I like that. I buy that at Murray's in Grand Central. Oh, so good. So, yeah. so good. And then um, if you're doing on the sweeter side of the Lambrusco, uh, the peaches, fresh fruit, you know, peaches and nectarines, because you see that, you know, what you were talking about, you had a lot of the regions of Lambrusco had peach aromas mm -hmm. and flavors in them. So taking that that fresh peach and biting into it and then having a, a Lambrusco with it. But the grilled peaches would be really good with the Lambrusco. Oh, yeah. Mike makes these. Oh, my God. He takes the peach. He cuts it in half. And then he, you know, where the pit goes, 
he mm-hmm. takes macaroons and he um, crumbles up the macaroons and does something with it and then stuffs the peach with the macaroon. And then he puts some sort of uh, sauce over it and then he bakes it. And that would be incredible. Wow. He's going to have to make that for me when I see him on Friday. Mike, make me oh, that's right. It's Memorial Day weekend. Yay. And then next weekend I get to see you. I know. All right. nice so that is the food pairings. Okay. So I'm up next with the five fun facts. Five fun facts of Lambrusco. Happy family. (laughs) Um, It's actually the most misunderstood wine because it's just not one grape variety or one wine. So it's extremely, the wild child is misunderstood, but isn't that normal? That is. Right? That is normal. So um, the home is... Amelia Rogamano, I can't, why can I have such a hard time with these foreign stuff? Rogamano, uh, region of Italy, which is home to, you know, Parmesan Reggiano cheese, prosciutto, di Parma, ham, balsamic vinegars of Modena. So this, this is fun. Isn't that a nice car? It is. Yes. So it's also home to Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati, and Ducati. There you go. There's my Ducati, baby. Mm -hmm. Yep. Pavarotti's favorite wine is uh, Lambrusco di whatever I'm drinking. Sobara, I believe. Oh. Bet you didn't know that. I did not. And um, do I have one more? 50% of Lambrusco is exported to the United States, Germany, France, Spain, and Brazil. All right. So I want one of those cars. I'm not picky. I'll take the Ducati. I'm not a motorcycle guy or Uh, girl. Well, you know, I used to be until my crashed um now i have post-traumatic stress disorder every time i hear a motorcycle or see a motorcycle of that i can deal with the with the harleys and stuff but when i see uh you know a a crotch rocket go flying by i really do have a post-traumatic stress raw whatever i saw when i was a kid i saw a uh bad motorcycle accident and i think that scarred me and the guy was laying in the road yeah that was mike Yeah. 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 We were riding and he went down in front of me and we had the audio boxes so I could hear him go down um, and see him go down. And then I spent the entire summer taking care of him because he broke his right scapula. His right um, ankle was severed. um, And uh, so, yeah, we we I I haven't been on a motorcycle since his I would. But I do love Ducatis. Oh my God, we did we did test runs of Ducatis, and I was in my little glory. I was like, Rear! you know, all over. Oh really? Them. Yeah, yeah. We drove down to. Um, we did a test ride in uh, English town of Kawasaki's, where we drove all of the different Kawasaki's, okay. and then we went. Um, I don't remember what town we were in that we did the Ducatis, and it just was like incredible to ride a Ducati. It really was. But that is Lambrusco. And that is Lambrusco. I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is still my first glass. <laughs> well, this is still my first glass, too. So I'm, I'm having, I'm, I'm on my front. It's not my favorite. It's not my favorite uh, wine. I think it has its place. Um, I- it was but, interesting to learn about it. Um, 
it's just I learned something new. I, I didn't realize it was a family of grapes. Right. Um, I thought it was very cool biologically. Um, how it is not a self pollinator. It, you know, it pollinates with everything out there. Um, but so the wild child not <laughs> also has sex with everything out there. Boy, there's just nothing good about this wild child. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it, it is, um, it's an interesting grape variety and it has its place. And as I definitely promote 100% of the time, do not let other people tell you what you like and what you don't like. I do the same thing. If you like it, you like it, drink it and enjoy it. And from what I've seen, the price point is fantastic. I mean, ten dollars for the bottle. Yeah, it it is what it is. Um, but it is not my cup of tea. Um, but do you know what is my cup cup of tea, Debbie? Cab Franc. Well, yes, Cab oh. Franc. But if I'm not drinking Cab Franc, oh, you know what kind of tea do you like? I like ordering wine from Wink dot com. Duh. Because what is incredible about Wink.com is that you do a little profile taste. You know, they ask you these little right. cute little questions, and they give you a palate profile. And from that palate profile, they start suggesting wines for you. And you can pick four bottles and put them in your shopping cart. They ship, a, ship them to you. And if you use our link, which is Try Wink. T R Y W I N C dot com forward slash wine for bet, you're going to get $22 off of your first order, which pretty much brings you four, do, uh, four bottles of wine for like 25 bucks. Um, That's the average deal. price. Yeah, because it's like 14 or 13 deal. bucks a bottle there. So for a little bit more than this Lambrusco, there is quite a bit out there. And uh, so that is my cup of tea. Try yeah, one for that. I think that is it's cool on how they match up your profile with like just different things, the different things that you like. Like if you like tea or coffee, just like right. that all that influences the types of wines that that you like. Absolutely. So, yeah. And so should we talk about if they yeah. su if they suggest a wine that you're like, yeah, no, not my, don't want that, no problem. You just don't put it in your shopping cart. Yeah, it doesn't get any better than that. Right. That, that X or UPS, bring it to your doorstep. Yeah, very Easy. nicely in like a day. Like it comes in a day. Really? It's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So next month, should we talk about next month? Yes. Next month, we visit Spain. Not going to lie, kind of happy to be out of Italy. Yeah. <laughs> gonna, I, I shouldn't say that because I would love to go back to Italy, but we've been doing quite a bit of Italy. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm kind of um, looking forward to it because the Mencia grape, I don't know anything about it. No, me neither. And I'm really looking forward to uh, learning about it and tasting the 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 wine. Yeah. It's not going to be a wild child, though. It's not going to be a wild child. It's not as wild as Lambrusco. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can get any wilder than that. No, no. We, we need to do the theme, wild thing. I think yeah. I love you. You don't want me singing, believe me. <laughs> So yes, so, so next week, uh, next month, uh, do you have the date, Debbie? Because I always count on you for that. Next month, it is uh, June 18th, Monday, June 18th, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, same bat channel. Lori and I will be here. Will you still be here? Or will you be I will still be, I will be back here, yes. Okay. Yes, I uh, will be back from California on the 30th. And then I head back to California on the 27th. Oh, okay. So that actually reminds me I need to pack my N and O. 
because that will be California. I need to pack them. Oh, yeah. You should have just waited to purchase them out there. Um, well, the N is a uh, wink wine. So oh, cool. it, got, it got sent to me here. Um, but the O and O, we're going to have a special guest, right? Right. That's what you said. Yes, we are going to have a special guest. I'm keeping him a secret, though. So we will have it? three people for O. That'll be fun. Yes. That will be so, a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody, oh, for yeah. joining. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Oh, he left. He just left. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for joining in. And as, uh, you know, Debbie and I said, it's uh, June, 8, June 18th is June the next month. And the link is in the chat. And we hope to see you there. And until then. And you know what? If you try a Liam Brusco, let us yeah. know what you think of it. Yeah. Because I know, you know it's, not my, it's not my cup of tea. It's not my favorite. But let us know what you think of it. But that's our palate. Yeah. You may think this is all that and more yeah. power to you. So, Slancha. Cheers. Cheers.